Hi guys, it's Ms. Sheehan, and today I'm going to do the last lecture of the year um, on the end of World War I and the peace treaty that officially ended it, the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, so I'd like you to take notes on this, and let's get into it. Okay, so let's review the timeline a little bit. Uh, World War I begins 1914. June 28th, 1914, the Archduke of Austria-Hungary, Franz Ferdinand, was shot. Um, and then we have the cascade of war, and by August, all the major countries of Europe are at war. Uh, we have the invasion of France by Germany and the miracle on the Marne, where the French stop the Germans, and then it turns into trench warfare. So by 1915, there's stalemate on the Western Front. 1916 sees the two biggest battles, Verdun and the Somme, and the beginning of Russia really struggling with the war. In 1917, the U.S. enters World War I, and Russia withdraws from the war because they have a revolution, um, and they are no longer in the war. And then 1918, the war ends. We'll talk about how that happened. And in 1919, the official treaty to start the peace was signed. So uh, let's talk briefly about something that happened at the same time as the end of World War I, which was the Great Influenza, which is also known as the Spanish Flu. Um, it began in the last months of the war, and it killed more people worldwide than all the battles of the war. Um, so it was a strain of flu that was particularly um, uh, contagious and particularly deadly, right? Um, it actually began in, or it was first detected in Kansas, and it was brought to Europe by American troops arriving in France to fight in the war. Um, and it swept the Western Front. It especially affected German troops because they were short on food. And so if you're hungry, your immune system is lower. Um, and then it vanished briefly, but then there was a second and a third wave that was much deadlier. And it affected civilians widely as well. So kind of similar to COVID-19. Um, luckily, COVID-19 is not as deadly as the influenza was. And we um, obviously have much better medical abilities and treatment now. Um, but this influenza killed within a few days. It was very deadly. And about 30 million people died of the influenza. So this was at the same time that the war was happening right at the end, where millions of people had already died in the war. And then we have this huge pandemic, essentially, um, that kills another 30 million people. So really, the population of the world took a big dive at the end of World War I. Okay. Go back to the war. So Russia withdrew from the war in 1917. And at that point, uh, Germany did not have to fight war on two fronts anymore. They only needed to fight on the Western Front. So they moved all their troops to France, but they had some problems. Their troops were not as strong anymore. They were uh, running out of food. Uh, they were running out of weapons from the war on attrition. Their troops were severely affected by the influenza, right? And the popular support for the war in Germany was fading. Um, and for it, Britain and France on the Western Front had just gotten a fresh influx of American troops who were completely fresh, lots of supplies, uh, ready to fight. And so the Allies counterattack, right? And uh, the Germans make one last big push called the Spring Offensive. Uh, they actually break through some of the trenches, and there is a second battle at the Marne where, again, the French and British, and this time Americans, managed to stop the Germans. And at that point, the Germans were completely exhausted. They had spent all of their resources and men on that last offensive. Um, and at that point, the allies, allies break through the lines of trenches. Uh, tanks were a big help to them and begin to advance into Germany the first time uh, during the whole war that this had happened, that actually the allies had managed to make it into Germany itself. And at this point, the other central powers begin to collapse. The Bulgarians surrender, the Ottoman Turks surrender, um, Austria-Hungary's troops were mutinying, and Germany was suffering famine and starvation at home. So, 
uh, in Germany, the troops uh, were mutinying and there was actually a change of government right at kind of the middle of 1918. Um, people decided that the king, the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, no longer was doing good for the people of Germany, and he actually stepped down. He abdicated his throne on November 9, 1918. And basically, he said, I'm no longer king anymore, and Germany became uh, a democracy, a new republic called the Weimar Republic. Um, and so very quickly, Germany went from a monarchy that was fighting a war to a republic that didn't want to fight a war anymore. And at that point, they ask for an armistice, an end to the fighting. And so a representative from Germany meets with a French commander in a railway car near the Western Front. So that's a picture of it there. And they basically say, we're ready to surrender. We're ready to stop fighting. Um, and they sign what's called an armistice, which is an agreement to stop the fighting. It's not a peace, it's not a treaty, um, but it's basically saying, we're gonna be done fighting. And at November 11th, 1918, at 11 a.m., so the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, it's very poetic, um, the armistice goes into effect. And what happens is essentially the soldiers put down their weapons and walk away. And just like that, the fighting was over. Right, And that's why we actually celebrate Veterans Day on November 11th. Um, and pretty much everywhere else in the world, it's called Armistice Day in remembrance of World War I. And in the US, we just call it Veterans Day and kind of lump a bunch of wars in there. Um, but that's the origin of that to remember the end of the Great War, World War I. Uh, so we'll just briefly look at some death tolls. Uh, so as you can see, Russia and Germany were the hardest hit with over 1.6 million um, uh, deaths of their military, of their soldiers each. Um, Russia, just by virtue of having the biggest population in Europe, uh, lost the largest number of soldiers. But France lost over 1.3 million, Britain almost um, a million people, and the U.S. a very small amount, only about 100 thousand soldiers for the U.S. died, which in comparison to everyone else is a very small number. Uh, and you can see that the Allied powers overall had about twice as many soldiers mobilized fighting in the war than the central powers, right? And here is a more specific breakdown. You can see um, that Germany, Russia, France, and Austria-Hungary lost the most and then Britain and Italy and uh, the Ottoman Empire. Okay, so at this point, the world needs an official peace treaty to end, to formally end the war. So representatives from a whole bunch of different countries, mostly allied powers, but also other countries like Japan, um, et cetera, meet in Paris to determine the terms of the peace. And this is called the Paris Peace Conference. And it was held at Versailles, which was the home of the French monarchs, right, built by Louis XIV, the Sun King. Um, and it began in January 1919. Um, it contained representatives from 32 countries who met to work out the terms of the peace, and Germany and its allies were not invited. Germany was not invited, and also Russia was not invited, because Russia was in the process of having a communist revolution, and the other countries, particularly Britain and France, were scared that they would spread their communism to uh, other European countries if they were invited. So two of the major European powers, Russia and Germany, were not actually invited to this peace treaty. Uh, and over the next six months till, until June 1919, the representatives wrote what was called the Treaty of Versailles that officially ended the war. And for me personally, because like World War I is like my area of historical interest, I think the Treaty of Versailles is one of the most um, important diplomatic documents of the 20th century. I'm sure other people will argue with me about that, but it becomes very influential and we'll talk about why. Okay. 
So the Treaty of Versailles was primarily written by what was called the Big Four, which were the leaders of Britain, France, the United States, and Italy. So the leader of Britain was the Prime Minister David Lloyd George. France, the Prime Minister was named George Clemenceau. Um, the United States President was named Woodrow Wilson. And then Italy's Prime Minister was Vittorio Orlando. Um, and the, Literally what they did was essentially just sit in a room and talk about what they wanted. Um, and basically they say, I want this. Do you agree? Yes. All right. We'll write it down. And essentially those four guys, although there were input from the other representatives and the other countries, but essentially those four guys um, created what would become the Treaty of Versailles. Um, so the Treaty of Versailles was uh, supposed to be based on what was called the 14 points. And the 14 points were Woodrow Wilson's plan for peace that he created during the war. And his goal um, was for the establishment of a lasting peace, right? Um, and a part of this was a concept of self-determination among nations, which was the idea that people should be able to choose their own countries and nationalities. Big, big caveat to this, Woodrow Wilson was extremely racist, and he did not, in his brain, he did not apply self-determination to anyone except white Europeans and Americans. Um, this certainly for him did not apply to Africans, didn't really apply to Asians, India absolutely not, really anyone that was not white European or white American, self-determination did not apply to. Um, no one in the Middle East, etc. But really kind of that was his like big talking point is that people in Europe should be able to choose um, what countries and nationalities they belong to. And that was kind of his big problem with the empires like Russia and Austria-Hungary is they did not allow people to determine their own countries and nationalities. So um, and also one of his big ideas was that he wanted to create an international alliance for peace that would stop war from ever happening again. So, um, and that's kind of what the Treaty of Versailles attempts to do. Most countries, and I will say many people in the world, wanted World War I to be the end of war for all time. And really, that's what a lot of people at the Paris Peace Conference thought they were doing, um, is, and is was ending war for all time. They felt like the war had been fought, it had been brutal, it had been bloody, it had been horrible, it had been tragic. They were done, right? They felt like we'd fought the war, it was awful, millions of people died, we don't need to fight a war again right? Um, so that's what they wanted. Um, but there was considerable debate among the big four, among Britain, France, the U.S., and Italy regarding the terms of the treaties, because they all had different goals. Britain and France were most concerned about their own national security, about protecting their own countries, and they were really concerned with punishing Germany for the war. Uh, the U.S. and Woodrow Wilson, because the U.S. hadn't fought any of the war on its soil, right, didn't come to the U.S., um, was less concerned about national security and more concerned about a lasting peace and international alliance. And he really wants to use, he really wanted to use this time to kind of launch the U.S. as a major player in international relations and international politics to become like those major European countries of Britain and France and Russia and Germany, right? And he saw this as an opportunity for the U.S. to do that. So the terms of the treaty, uh, territory was taken from Germany and returned from, to France, particularly this one piece of territory that Germany and France had disputed called Alsace-Lorraine. Uh, German colonies uh, were taken away from Germany uh, and they became what were called mandates that were controlled by this new international organization called the League of Nations. Uh, it severely limited the German military. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And Germany had to accept blame for the war, and this was called the so-called War Guilt Clause. So this political cartoon, I know it's hard to read, but this is the big four forcing Germany to swallow the peace terms. And it says, you've got to swallow it whether you like it or not, right? Um, so basically they're saying, you have to accept these terms. So probably one of the most significant pieces of the Treaty of Versailles was Article 231, which was called the War Guilt Clause. And it said that Germany must accept sole blame 
for the war. Basically that Germany had to admit that they caused the war, which if you think back to the beginning of the war, did they really? It's kind of debatable. I mean, a Serbian shot an Austro-Hungarian. Germany didn't invade France, but Russia was already mobilizing, right? So remember, it was kind of like a confusing time. But Britain and France really wanted to blame Germany because they did not want Germany to be powerful. Um, and part of this was forcing uh, Germany to pay money to the allies, to Britain and France, um, to basically pay them back for the money they had spent on the war. And that's called reparations. Um, and that was about $33 billion in today's money. Uh, and this was really hard for a lot of people of Germany to accept. They felt like they did not deserve the blame for the war. Um, and it kind of made relationships between the French and the British and the Germans really bad because they were saying like, right, it was a way for British and French to kind of justify the war and say, well, Germany started it. And um, for Germans, this really hurt them. Okay, so for military restrictions, basically the idea was to prevent Germany from ever being able to fight a war, to start a war. Uh, so they could not manufacture, they could not import weapons or war materials. It limited the size of their military to 100,000 men, which is extremely small, right? Our military right now is about one and a half to two million people in the US, so 100,000 is very small. Uh, it limited the size of ships they could have. They weren't allowed any submarines. They couldn't have airplanes. They couldn't have guns over a certain size, right? It basically was trying to take away their entire ability to make war on other people. Okay. And then uh, one of the biggest things and probably one of the biggest effects on international relations the Treaty of Versailles had was establishing an international association association of nations called the League of Nations. This was based on one of Woodrow Wilson's ideas and the main goal was to keep the peace and stop another war from breaking out. So you might be thinking, hey, we have something like that now called the United Nations and we do and that was created after the Second World War because the League of Nations uh, didn't work. And primarily the reason it didn't work is there were no consequences for people who broke some of the League of Nations rules. So if another country, so part of the, um, the charter of the League of Nations said that um, no country in the League of Nations can go to war against another country, that's against the rules, but it didn't say what would happen if they did. Right? It didn't say we will attack them. It didn't say we will sanction them or take their money or whatever, right? There were no consequences. And so, kind of and nothing happened. And so their uh, goal of keeping the peace and creating this kind of like league of European and world powers didn't really do anything. And the United Nations is the second attempt to create this kind of international alliance for peace. Um, okay, so as I said, Germany was not part of the negotiations. After the treaty was written, um, basically they were invited, some, German representatives were invited to the Paris Peace Conference. They were given this huge treaty, it's like 400 pages, and said, read this, and in two days, you guys have to sign it. So they were not able to make any changes um, or anything, and they were just forced to sign it. Uh, Germany never believed that they had lost the war for a lot of Germans because there was no uh, real war fighting done on German territory. It was mostly done in France and Belgium on the Western Front and then in Russia on the Eastern Front. Um, they never really felt like they had lost the war. Uh, Germans had surrendered and said, okay, we'll agree to a peace if it's on the basis of the 14 points. Um, but the Treaty of Versailles did not end up being on the basis of the 14 points. We'll look at that in a minute. And the treaty was very harsh on Germany. It took away their territory, we'll look at a map in a minute, restricted their military, um, it blamed them for the war, and they lost their colonies, right? So it was a lot of punishment for Germany. Um, so at the same time as the Treaty of Versailles, the Allies signed treaties with the other central powers as well. And in fact, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire were completely broken up. So Austria-Hungary was carved into four different countries, Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia, which were two brand new countries. 
Uh, the Ottoman Empire only got to keep Turkey, what became modern Turkey, and then other areas in the Middle East and Northern Africa were made into nations and then colonies controlled by the League of Nations, um, etc. So let's look at a map here. Um, so this is Europe in 1914, so you can see France, Italy, Germany, Russia, you can see how big Germany is here, Austria-Hungary. And then this is Europe in 1919. So you can see Germany is much smaller. We have this brand new country of Poland. Russia is pushed all the way back here. We have all these new countries of Latvia, Lithuania, and Belarus and the Ukraine. We have these uh, no more Austria-Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Austria-Hungary, Yugoslavia here. Um, we have France taking some territory from the German Republic. We have some, if you could see up here, we have some new countries there. Um, Ireland becomes independent in 19. 16 they have home rule or most of Ireland does right and the Ottoman Empire ceases to exist as well so huge changes were made to the map of Europe it completely the war completely changed the map of Europe so let's just briefly look at the 14 points versus the Treaty of Versailles so 14 points wanted the League of Nations freedom of the seas freedom of trade limit of arms and military uh, an end to secret alliances like the Triple Entente and the Triple Alliance before the war, um, granting all colonies and nations independence, and the right to self-determination for all nations. Um, the Treaty of Versailles returned Alsace-Lorraine to France, that small area between France and Germany. It limited the military just for Germany. Um, it had Allied troops occupy an area of Germany for 15 years, called the Rhineland. It created new countries for nations in Eastern Europe, but certainly did not give all colonies and nations independence. It made Germany pay reparations for the war, pay money to the Allies, and forced Germany to sign a guilt clause. So you can see the Treaty of Versailles was much more... Um, uh, punishment for Germany than it was about creating an international agreement or peace. So some problems, many countries disagreed with the terms of the treaty. Um, they thought it was too harsh or that it didn't do enough. Um, it wasn't fair to other countries and colonies, etc. Um, most countries felt like the treaty was um, heavily uh, shifted towards Britain, France, and the US because those were the guys that had created it rather than like, um, you know, considering other countries in Europe. Um, and one of the biggest problems that you'll look at when you get to US history as a junior was that America actually uh, rejected the treaty because in America, the president can sign any treaty that he wants, but then it goes back to Congress and basically Congress has to vote and say, yes, we agree to sign this. And then it becomes a treaty that America um, abides by. And Congress voted no, they rejected the Treaty of Versailles. So even though Woodrow Wilson had spent six, six months and had signed this treaty, um, Congress rejected it. And that was one of the big problems with it is that the US wasn't a part of it eventually. Um, and so that becomes a major problem is the US doesn't abide by the treaty. Uh, Germany was very bitter about the war guilt clause, right? So all of these problems kind of came up later. And I don't, I don't know what happened to my slide, but just a side note, the treaty was signed on June 28th, 1919, uh, which was exactly five years after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. So there's a lot of symbolism in World War I. So uh, overall impact of the war, um, maths deaths, not counting the influenza, um, about 14 million soldiers and civilians died in Europe and in other places, North Africa, Turkey. Uh, $3,338 billion were total, total was spent on the war. Uh, warfare was forever changed. Um, this was really the first time that modern weapons and tactics had been used on a large scale. And as we talked about, that caused mass deaths and a really horrible type of fighting. It completely changed the map of Europe, restructured Europe, shifted the balance of power between the various countries. Um, it created a very bitter German populace. Um, not only did they have a brand new type of government, they were also angry at other people. Um, 
it was really um, something that's a little harder to explain, but it was really the start of what we think of as modernity, right? This idea that the world wasn't a positive thing, that there was a lot of disillusionment and despair about the course of history and the course of the future. Um, the idea of cynicism, as you looked at with the poems and stuff from last week, right? This change in like war being heroic to war being something tragic and awful, right? That's part of the legacy of World War I. Um, and it really sets the stage for the rise of the Nazi party in Germany and the rise of fascism in other countries and the start of World War II. And a lot of historians draw a very straight line from the Treaty of Versailles to what caused World War II. And you'll talk more about that in World History III. Um, so a lot of, so some people even consider World War II just a extension of World War I, right? That it just have it was just continuing on 30 years later. Um, and it certainly wasn't the end of war for all time as people wanted, which is really tragic considering the amount of life that was lost in really horrible and brutal ways. Okay, that is it for the war. Um, and tomorrow you'll answer just some critical thinking questions on the Treaty of Versailles, and then we're done with new content for the rest of the year. Um, all right, I hope you guys are doing well and having a good day, staying safe and healthy.